I'm a biblical counselor and a pastor and a Bible teacher, so I'm going to pray. How about that? Okay. Heavenly Father, I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to be here today and for everyone that is here, both in person and online. We've had a lot of technical difficulties today. Man-made things don't work the way the things you made do. So we ask that you would intervene, intercede, get this stuff to work for us so that this will be an enjoyable experience for everyone that's involved. Help my voice to carry so that everybody in the room can hear me. Um, I'm deeply grateful that you put on my heart and the hearts of others to bring all this information together and get it into a printed form as a tool to help your children. Uh, give me eloquence, clarity of speech, and the ability to communicate well as a representative of you and your kingdom. Thank you that you've adopted us as your children, and so there are things that we have access to that those who don't know you do not. So let today be a time that equips us, strengthens us, encourages us, emboldens us, and prepares us to share the gospel in the lives of the deeply broken and wounded. So we always want to surrender ourselves and our time to you and re reflect your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, I have to switch glasses too, sorry. <clears throat> um, so, t as you know, this is a workshop on domestic oppression, right? Jessica is a woman in her early 30s. She's been married for 13 years. Kevin has never hit Jessica, yet she lives with an ever-present sense of powerlessness, worthlessness, and hopelessness, all blanketed with an impending sense of doom. He's risen up and gotten large and threatening, slammed his open hand or fist down on a table or countertop, even thrown things in her direction. But he's never struck her. Instead, Kevin is increasingly dominated and controlled more and more aspects of Jessica's life, to the point that even her thoughts are subject to his screening and scrutiny. On top of that, nothing she does is ever right or good enough to satisfy him, let alone make him happy. Her hair, her makeup, her choice of clothing, her laugh, her housekeeping, the way she walks, how she handles money, which she doesn't allow her to do anymore because she'll only make a mess of it, the foods that she at least thinks she likes, nothing is good or right or acceptable. And since he's never hit her, never punched her, never choked her or pulled her hair, Kevin hasn't abused Jessica. At least that's what the pastors and others in her church have always said. And because the scriptures teach that she is to be subject to her husband and everything, there really are no options open to her other than to remain and endure. As Jessica sits in a counseling session with a biblical counselor that she was referred to by a friend, and describes what life has been like with Kevin and what she's come to believe about how worthless she is, her counselor says gently, Jessica, what you are experiencing is domestic oppression, and it is not okay with God for this to be happening to you. And why is my thing not advancing? There it is. Um, excuse me, I get technical stuff over here. I don't know how to make this happen. Okay. <clears throat> Neither Jessica nor the people in her church understand that Kevin's domineering and controlling treatment of her is a form of abuse that almost no one is talking about, let alone talking about openly or clearly, and that's domestic oppression. Jessica had never heard the term before, but after an initial moment of surprise, she finds it resonating in her heart and her mind that, yes, oppression was the perfect word to express what she'd been living under. Wait, what? It's not okay? with God for this to be happening to me? She couldn't get her mind around it yet, but those words planted seeds of hope that eventually would grow and produce amazing fruit. I want to welcome you today to... Thank you. Um, this workshop. Um, I'm excited to be able to present this today, both to you in person and to people online. We have people from all over the world that are part of this. Um, We've never done an event like this, so um, it's a new experience for us. Um, um, the uh, 
thing we want to be discussing today is what I believe to be one of the most critical uh, matters impacting the body of Christ in our day, and that's domestic oppression. Now, with everything that's happening in our world around us, and it's propelling our nation towards destruction, that may seem like an overstatement, but it isn't. Statistically, oops, sorry, I can't get this to catch up. I have no idea why this is not working. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe my batteries are low, right? So to statistically, when a pastor stands in a pulpit on a Sunday morning, out of every 100 people sitting in front of him, only 12 to 14 of those people are not survivors of personal abuse and oppression or firsthand witnesses to it in their own home. That means, statistically, 86 to 88% of the people sitting in churches in America, your church, my church, churches all over, have either been subjected to oppression or abuse or seen it happen to somebody else in their own home. And those are the stats. Um, And people want to argue against that, but it's very real. And as we talk today, you may discover that there are things that have happened in your life that resonate with what we're going to be talking about. Um... So we'll, we'll come back to this a little bit later. Thank you. Well, that's not going to help. Um, here, let me do this. I'll try to be... Thanks, guys, for your patience. So there it is. There's my stat one. Thank you. Here, you want that? Thanks. Don, very helpful. <laughs> um, matter of fact, uh, partnering with their organization is why we're even here today. Um, so, but unfortunately, as a, a pastor and biblical counselor, I've witnessed over the past few decades that the church as a whole has lacked the language, the ability, even the willingness to properly address this soul-consuming and pernicious evil called domestic oppression. Even more sadly still, I've spoken to hundreds of leaders who have lacked the will to address it, even to get educated. I'm excited about the people that are here today. Lately, I've had more and more conversations with people who are going, you know, I think that we want to know more. Um, so for our conversation today, I'm going to be um, you use a brand new book that was released this last weekend as our outline and framework today. It's uh, Behind the Veil, Exposing the Evil Domestic pr- Oppression and Providing Hope. Um, my goal and desire in writing this book and in offering this workshop today are to trigger a much-needed, long-overdue conversation. As a matter of fact, the final com- uh pressure I got from God was at a biblical counseling conference last spring, and the gal that wrote the um, foreword really, sorry, we, we had a conversation, and she said, we need that book, and so when she said that, I, I, I really took it to heart, because this is someone who's greatly respected in the biblical counseling world, somebody I have a great deal of respect for as a colleague and uh, her and her husband are friends. Um, And it was like, it's something that God had been gnawing on me. I have got eight writing projects in the works that I haven't finished. And I put the one I was working on, I put on hold and God helped me do this in two writing sessions over the course of the, not even a year. So um, I really believe that God was behind the whole thing because this is something I've been talking about for years and years and years. Um, It's just, (laughs) we need to understand this better. We need to have better insight into this if we're going to represent Christ well in the lives of the oppressed. Um, Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery to the sight of the blind, to send the oppressed into liberty. See, oppression is a big deal to him. The reason he came was because of oppression, the oppression of his people. Think about that. We all think that just has to do with sin. That's not just our own sin. That's the sin that others commit that wreak havoc in our lives. There's sins we've committed. There's evils we've suffered as a result of other people's sins. And then there's the lies we believe as a result of sin in the world in general. Um, um, so I'm kind of lost here. Um, I'm just going to throw my papers on the floor, okay? So, 
domestic oppression is not just out there in the world, but is operating right here within the body of Christ. Hopefully, we can change the conversation about this critical malevolence and impact it for the better. As a recovered psychologist uh, who was converted at 31, God's taught me a great deal about a great deal. Uh, he's given me the opportunity to study his word at a postgraduate level for many years, but he has taught me more about oppression and abuse than just about anything else, and his view on it and his answer for it. I had a hermeneutics professor several years ago. He said, you, you really do understand God's word, but I'm amazed at how well you understand this stuff. And that's when, that's way back, that's 20-some years ago. I've learned a lot more since then. Um, as I've studied and shared God's word, both as a pastor and Bible teacher and also as a biblical counselor, God has allowed me to be part of his healing work in the lives of a couple thousand survivors. Um, the worst part of all their stories is the heinous maltreatment many of them have suffered at the hands of the leaders of churches they've been a part of when they came forward about the domestic oppression and abuse they were being subjected to. Until a few years ago, there was very little about abuse in general from a Christian perspective and nothing at all about domestic oppression. I'm deeply grateful to the handful of voices that have begun speaking into this vacuum with clarity and truth. Um, Because for a long time, I was like Elijah. I thought I was the only one. Behind the veil is an effort to refine the conversation that we're only just now beginning to hear with the evangelical churches in America. It's also an effort to give voice to the thousands upon thousands of domestic oppression survivors who sit in churches Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, suffering in silence, because if they come forward, they're not going to be believed, or they'll be accused of lying and of being uh, uh, rebellious if they do come forward. And don't think that doesn't happen. It happens more often than it does not. Uh, So it is time to look behind the veil, to identify and expose this dark evil that is allowed to hide in plain sight, not only in what's being passed off as Christian marriages, but also as what is being done to the Bride of Christ by those who are trusted to protect and preserve her. So why did I feel compelled to write this and do workshops like this one? Well, We need an effective tool to describe in clear language the oppression that so many women and children and some men experience in the one place that God has designed to be a haven of safety, of love, nurture, care for all those who are created in his image, and that's the home. Also, to demonstrate from Scripture how God regards the oppressors and the oppressed and the mandate he has charged his under-shepherds with in both regards and to minister to the wounded and broken, to those who have been serially victimized by both oppressors and by the way the majority of leaders within God's church have so heinously handled the sinners and the sinned on, usually flipping things on their head and punishing the victim instead of the victimizer. And you might think that's strong language, but kids, if you if you pay attention, it's... Um, Sophia Lee's articles in World Magazine over the last year... Um, she basically, if it hadn't been for the legal department, she really would have been naming names in one of the articles. But because the legal department for World Magazine, they had to be they had to be a lot more careful because they were threatened with a lawsuit for speaking the truth about who who was doing what. Um, so um, let's talk about this domestic oppression. What is that? Yeah, people. Sorry, I have nobody to do that for me. Um, So what is that? Um, Over the last few years, I've had more conversations with more people than I can count about domestic oppression. And whenever I use the term, people turn their heads sideways, look at me and go, domestic oppression? Hmm, what's that? And that, friends, is why this workshop and this book are necessary. Um, Words matter. Anybody who knows me know that that's like, one of my, I got that, I need that tattooed someplace, right? <laughs> it's actually a chapter, it's actually the title of chapter one in the book, right? That's how important this is. So, domestic oppression is a very real, very present, and very growing form of abuse, all of its own. Up until a few months ago, if you did a Google search of this term, the first five or six entries you would see on the first page of the results were blog posts of mine. Now, I checked this morning, and one of my blog posts is number four on the face page. 
So again, it's starting to become more more talked about. But most of what you see is from a secular perspective. It's not from a biblical perspective. I'm sorry, guys, that's just wrong. If Jesus came to send the oppressed into liberty, why isn't the church the biggest voice against it? That's a rhetorical question. I have the answers. <laughs> Lately, I am hearing the term being used in more and more places in biblical counseling world. I'm deeply grateful for that. I'm, I'm still waiting it for it to reach the seminaries, but they're behind by about a decade. Um, so what is domestic oppression, and why do we need this specific language? Domestic oppression is the seedbed, it's the foundation of every form of abuse, including domestic abuse. Domestic oppression is itself a form of abuse, and it underlies and creates the environment where domestic abuse can take place. Domestic oppression is a dominating and primary factor in all forms of abuse that take place within the home, and it's growing inside the church at an alarming rate. Writing this book and offering this workshop today is an attempt to shine the light on the increasing pervasiveness of domestic oppression within what God expects to be the safest space for his adopted children to live and move. It's an attempt to to redeem and restore what has instead become one of the most dangerous and traumatic places for his children to live. And this book and this workshop today are an attempt to pull back the veil and expose the plethora of Christ's under-shepherds who sometimes out of complete ignorance not only enable the oppressors but actually co-sign the oppressor and and then re-victimize the oppressed. Um, and I don't know how much that's out of ignorance or willfulness, but I run into a lot of willfulness over and over and over. Um, it's, it's epidemic. Um, so we have to understand several things. Or this forbidden evil is specifically forbidden by God, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. It will continue to grow and spread among those whom Christ came to set free and send into liberty. We need to fully understand that biblically and practically, Domestic oppression is a real thing. We need to understand that domestic oppression is a form of abuse all of its own, and we need to understand that Christ's under-shepherds are mandated to rescue the oppressed and to cut off the oppressors. And the Bible, biblical language is very, very specific. We need to understand that those who oppress his people are guilty of the exact evil for which Jesus rebuked and condemned the scribes and Pharisees with the strongest and most severe condemnations in all of Scripture. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. Unless we do, this wickedness will continue to destroy the lives and hopes and sometimes even the faith of those whom Christ came to save. We need to admit that there's a horde of hypocrites who stand behind the veil of Christianity, church attendance, ministry activity, extravagant giving, and all the other things that good Christians do, all to create an avatar that's not their true self, but is a mirage that they manufacture and maintain in order to fool those who might hold them accountable and put a stop to this evil. I'm passionate about this. Can you tell? (laughs) For those who think this is neutral territory, you're not only grossly mistaken, whether you want to admit it or not, you automatically are siding with the oppressor by default. For you see, when it comes to oppression and abuse, there's no neutral territory. In Ecclesiastes... 4.1. 4.1. Where is it? There it is. Ecclesiastes 4.1. So I again considered all the oppression that continually occurs on the earth. Oh, you mean it's not, it's not uncommon? No. This is what I saw. The oppressed were in tears, but no one was comforting them. No one delivers them from the power of the oppressors. And then Ellie Weissel, some of you may know who he is. He's a um, um, Nobel Prize winning writer, teacher, activist, and best known for his memoir, Night where he recounts his experiences surviving the Holocaust. He says, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. And then a quote that um, I'm known for is, when it comes to oppression and abuse, there is no Switzerland. There is no neutral territory. So one important thought to keep in mind as we walk down this path together today, betrayal, oppression, and abuse are redeemable, because God brought redemption into the world through betrayal, oppression, and abuse. Jesus gets it. Okay. So, let's talk about words matter. Could you just go back a couple slides? You've had a second definition of domestic oppression. Could you just flip back a couple, do you mind? I really don't have to. It's in the book. Okay. It's in the book. Sorry. I, 
So, domestic oppression isn't considered an official category of abuse yet, and I hope to help people see why that needs to change and to change quickly. So, defining terms. Since words matter, I know that you're going to hear that a lot today, let's begin with a working definition of oppression and then flesh things out from there. Okay? Oppression is the systematic, and that word's significant, unjust, burdensome, excessive, or cruel exercise of authority or power. Oppression is the subjection of a person or persons to unjust demands, obligations, or controls. Now, it's intentional, deliberate, and planned. It's not accidental or happenstance. If they can ever not be oppressive when the right person is watching, that shows that they are choosing when and whom to oppress. Simple logic, kids. Simple logic. Okay. Again, you can tell I'm really passionate about this. Um, taking this definition and applying it in the context of the home, we arrive at a viable definition of domestic oppression. Domestic oppression is an ongoing pattern of intimidating and domineering behavior employed by one family member to control other family members, and generally the spouse. Now, we're going to discuss some of the subcategories of domestic oppression later, but it's essential to understand the underlying flavor of the relational dynamics employed by the oppressor. Domestic oppression is about power and control. It's about dominance and supremacy, about ruling and reigning over a self-proclaimed kingdom in which the family, especially the spouse, is a principal servant. That's what it's about. This is my kingdom and I shall reign. Domestic oppressors systematically tyrannize, emotionally coerce, dehumanize, it's keeping up good, objectify, demean, degrade, manipulate, and bully at least one other person in the family home, usually their spouse, to fuel their idolatry of power and control. That's their idol. Power and control is their idol. It rarely stops there, but is then perpetrated on the entire household. But when we talk about, um, about how they pull it off, when we talk about tactics and systems for how, this even, how a person ends up drawing a victim into that and how a, a victim ends up getting drawn into that, we'll see that it's, it's very systematic and very intentional. What people are often most surprised to discover is that domestic oppression is far more damaging and more enduring in its harmful effects than almost every other form of abuse. Because there's no bruises, no scratches, nothing's broken, no teeth marks, nothing obvious to the human eye. But the damage to the human soul is incalculable. See, the degrading treatment, the demeaning words, the manipulation and coerciveness, and the denial of the imago dei dignity of the oppressed mangles the soul like nothing else. When you add to this the spiritual abuse factor that often accompanies domestic oppression. This is where somebody uses the word of God to say, you must submit to my oppression. The Bible doesn't teach that, but that's what a lot of people believe and that's what people are subjected to. You end up with one of the most perniciously and systematically ruthless dehumanizing abuse scenarios a person can be subjected to. I'm not using too strong a language, really. And anybody that's been subjected to that I know this is resonating in your heart. See, human beings connect with God and each other on a soul level. We're the only part of his creation that does so. That's the Imago Dei. When those connections are fractured and fragmented as a result of oppression and abuse, the heart is wounded, even crushed, and the soul mangled. So picture, if you will, a brand new roll of aluminum foil. You take a sheet off, you lay it out, and what, you can see your, your image reflected in it, right? Image reflected. Wad it up and flatten it out. What happens? It's all fractured and fragmented, isn't it? Do it again. And do it again. And do it again. And yet again. And you have this, this mangled ball that when you try to flatten it out, it tears. That's exactly what happens to the human soul with repeated, serial, unrepentant oppression and abuse. Think about it. The Imago Dei, the image of God, gets so distorted and so fragmented, they can't even see it in themselves. When you add violence to domestic oppression, 
And you have you you fashion then from the victim as an individual whose belief is more solid than ever that there's no escape, no hope of relief, no one to hear the cries of their heart and rescue them. And they believe that this is because it's either too dangerous for them to leave, that they are responsible for their own abuse, and their victimizer is only give, victimizer is only giving them what they have coming to them, or that God requires them to stay married to that no matter what. The violence component of domestic abuse intensifies the sense of hopelessness and worthlessness, and it leaves them feeling completely powerless. It binds the oppression to their soul, hijacking one's identity, as one survivor described it, and convinces them that this is what their life is. This is their destiny. This is what they deserve. This is what God created them for, that this is the best they can hope for, and there is no escape, so don't even think about it. That's all one word. It's the violence factor that takes the non-physical abuse of domestic oppression and makes it domestic violence or domestic abuse. That's the only difference between the two forms of abuse, and that's the violence factor. That distinction is critical. So you, when you have somebody who, who says they're being abused, and you ask, well, did he hit you? I'm sorry. You need to put your membership card in the garbage and walk away. You've got no business talking to that person about that. Because... They are being abused. Just because violence is missing doesn't mean they're not. And I, am, I can't even tell you how passionate about this I am. I sit across from people day after day after day after day and have for decades. I've counseled over 4,000 people as a biblical counselor. 96% of those people are survivors of oppression and abuse. Okay? I get this. I grew up with it. So... It's been part of my life. This is, this is a, almost a 63-year writing project, this whole thing. Anyway, I've got to not take my glasses off because I'll get sidetracked. <laughs> Here's another term that I use a lot, and that's emotional predator. We need to define and understand emotional predator because this term is getting more widespread use in the world of secular psychology. It's getting almost no airtime in Christian circles, even though there are dozens of examples in Scripture. Now, emotional predation is something that I lay out very comprehensively, uh, as much as I could manage in chapter 6 of the, of the book. But it's, we have to understand that, that emotional predation, there's a spectrum of it. Everywhere from, from um, someone who's just super selfish all the way out to narcissism, uh, sociopathy, psychopathy, uh, the, the dark triad, they call it. Um, um, but which, what we'll find is when you go through that chapter and you take a look at the tactics and systems that they use, you lay down a domestic oppressor, uh, oppressor and their emotionally predatory tactics down next to a, a sexual predator, and they're exactly the same. They are exactly the same. There is no difference except for maybe the degree of sexual component. Really, you lay the... I actually had someone look at that who deals a great deal with uh, children who have been sexually abused. And they said, yeah, this is, a, this is a child sexual predator you described. I said, this is actually a domestic oppressor. And they were just blown away. Um, so how does one spot an emotional predator? It's easier than you think. Um... Oh, shoot, I forgot to say that. Um, think of it as emotional vampirism. They suck the life, the soul, out of their victim. They can't live without it. The, the book I'm going to go back and finish is uh, on understanding and dealing with narcissism biblically. So, fun topic, right? But, so, Recognize these guys? Matthew 23, 1 through 39, is perhaps the greatest character study of emotional predators and oppressors in all of Scripture. We're going to look at it in great detail in chapter 3, God on Oppression. But I want to take a look, a glimpse at this, and unpack it a little bit. In this particular section of Matthew, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and the crowd of people surrounding them that day. Um, he begins by warning those listening that since the scribes and Pharisees occupy legitimate positions of authority in their lives, pay attention, to pay attention to what they tell you and do it. So if it's within keeping with God's 
command and it's, and it's righteous, then you do it. He said, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach. Okay? He says, they tie up heavy loads, hard to carry, put them on men's shoulders. We could say wives and children's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing even to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by people. It's all about the avatar, the public image. They love the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and elaborate greetings in the marketplace. They have people call them rabbi. Legitimate authority properly um, exercised is God-honoring, and, 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 but it's, a, it's servant leadership. Leadership is never for the good of the one in leadership. It's always for the good of those who are being led. That's the example we have from Jesus, right? So any leadership that does not model that is not biblically consistent or Christian. It's really that simple. Because a simple definition of being Christian means to reflect the character of Christ. Very simple. If it doesn't reflect the character of Christ, it's not being Christian. It doesn't mean that person isn't, but they're not behaving that way. And if that's the fruit of their life, we'll talk about that later too. All right, <clears throat> so these verses here in Matthew 23 tell us a great deal about the heart motivations of oppressors and emotional predators. They also give us a pretty clear picture of God's attitude toward oppression and oppressors. They are hypocrites, telling other people how to live, but not living that way themselves. They create all kinds of of detailed and difficult expectations for others to live up to, piling them one on top of the other, but they leave the victims weighted down without any help or hope. And what's interesting about it is with a domestic oppressor, it doesn't matter what the target is. As soon as you shoot for the target, the target gets moved, and you can never hit it. You can never hit it. Because that's not the real target. They lust for adoration of others. There we say worship. Living for the accolades and praises of those around them, yet knowing in their hearts that they are undeserving of such honors. They demand tribute from those they consider lower than them, flaunting their supposed superiority and feeling entitled to being honored and bowed before by their underlings. These two uh, are actually apt descriptions of the two primary, primary traits of narcissists, but that's another book and another workshop. Um, <laughs> but these really are fitting descriptions of domestic oppressors, their attitudes and motivations, and their treatment of others. Now think about the people in your life. Does this describe someone you know? Does this describe um, someone whose attitude, behavior has caused you to really question your worth and value? Chances are, then, you are in a relationship with an emotional predator. If it's someone you're married to or the child of, then chances are excellent that you are being subjected to domestic oppression. People want to say degrees. Okay, so how many times can I hit you with a club before it's too much? How much arsenic can I put in your tea before you won't drink it? There is zero oppression allowed by God. Zero, zero, none, nada. None is allowed by God. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. We really have to have God's mindset about oppression. Okay. Now, um, but maybe you're thinking of someone you know, a friend, a church member, a sister. Hopefully this will help you have a better conversation, know how to pray better, even talk to the leaders of the church about this. Um, where am I time-wise? Okay. Um, I want to do a few more minutes. We got started late, but I want to do a little bit, open up a little bit Q&A. I, I know that's asking for a whole lot of trouble, but I'm brave. I can do this. Okay. Um, in chapter two, we talk about the effects of domestic oppression, what I saw call soul cancer. Now, there's a lot we could discuss about it today, um, but... I'm going to touch on it lightly. The, this is the longest chapter in Behind the Veil because it delves deeply into this. The effects of domestic oppression can be thought of as soul cancer because it eats away and erodes a person's connection to their inherent worth and value as one who bears the image of God. And this is a chapter where, uh, I, where we talk about hijacking 
one's soul, hijacking one's life, hijacking one's identity. And we're not talking about identity theft in the sense of writing checks, although that was part of it. We're talking about who they are as a person. Their personhood gets hijacked. Um, and one of the things I want to, I probably ought to have mentioned earlier, hang on, um, is that there, there are people whose, co- whose stories are, at the, are like the core story of each of the vignettes that I start each chapter with, but I've cobbled together pieces of a whole bunch of other people's stories so that, is that my story? Sounds like it. It's not exactly the same. Because, um, you know, we, we want to protect the innocent. We, we, and I don't want people, I don't want to obviously say, oh, you told them about this? That's something, that's your story to have. That's your conversation to have with those people. That's not my conversation to have with those people in your life. But, <clears throat> or their lives. But um, um, I, I could not have done this without, I, without the, the willingness and the cooperation of several people um, and I, I'm keeping the permission to use for the next book, too. So if you didn't get in this one, you'll be in the next one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. Um, I want to talk about God's original design. God's original design, his created intent, is for his image bearers to experience safe, caring, loving, nurturing relationship. Okay. First with our biological parents, then our nuclear family, then our extended family and expanding circles of relationship. Now, the closer into the center of this and the earlier in life that God's design is breached, for whatever reason, the deeper and more significant the impact on the heart, mind, soul of the one on the receiving end. Okay? So, the longer the desecration of God's design goes on, the deeper and more significant the wounding of one's heart, the distortion of one's thinking, and the mangling of one's soul. When this is perpetuated intentionally, as is the case with domestic oppression and abuse, it becomes like a cancer to one's soul. And the devastation is is immeasurable. Hearts, minds, souls are ravaged. Lives are laid waste. Futures are commandeered. Hope is gone. Oppression, abuse, and neglect are forms of interpersonal victimization of one person by at least one other person that violates God's created order and transcendent moral code, especially as regards human relationship. This is a biblical understanding of abandonment, neglect, oppression, abuse. <clears throat> okay, all of it is a violation of God's design for human relationship. Okay, that's our plumb line. We cannot use the fallenness of man. We cannot use someone else's bad as 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 a gauge for well, I'm not that bad. No, you're not this righteous. That's our standard over here. Okay. And people think that's too... No, that's what Jesus said. That's what we see all throughout Scripture. This is the standard. If you're not doing this, you need to get on your face before God, repent, seek His forgiveness, and then walk forgiven, which means you don't go back that way. And we're going to talk about forgiveness a little bit later. Um, oppression, abuse, and neglect deny and degrade the Imago Dei and those who are victimized. Because of the Imago Dei, every human being has inherent worth and value. No matter where they've been, no matter what's been done to them. You know, the word picture I often use is a block of gold. It doesn't matter what you do to it. Refine it, turn it into jewelry, stick it under a manure pile. It's still gold, still has inherent value. The Imago Dei in every human being gives them inherent worth and value no matter what anybody else tells you. And that's what Scripture tells us. Um, and... On a, in another context, I can string the pearls together and demonstrate for you how that is absolutely critical for us to understand. Otherwise, the gospel doesn't even make sense. Another thing I'm passionate about. <laughs> I'm kind of passionate. Um, the dynamics of oppression and abuse within families and in indiv- in individual lives are distinctly and decidedly destructive. Um, it, it, it impacts adults and children differently, but it's still is such a gross violation of God's created order that, that the person is changed. It's changed. How they see and understand God, how they see and understand themselves, how they see and understand relationship is so off the mark for what God says, this is my design, this is my created intent, this is my order for things. That it's like they're on one side of the Grand Canyon and God's design is on the other. 
So I'm going to pause there. Um, we're going to take about 10 minutes of Q&A, and then we'll take a, like a five-minute break or so. I'm going to open up to on here. Um, oh, this is scary. I don't know. Um, what I'd appreciate for all the online people, if you will send me a chat that you have a question, I'll try and unmute you. Okay? Anybody here? Question? What if it's not intentional? That's not possible. Something happened occasionally is one thing, but it's systematic, it's repeated, there's intent. They know it's wrong, they do it anyway. You can't, nowhere can you convince me that someone is serially domestically oppressive by accident. That just defies logic. They just don't have the awareness because of their past, how they were raised, because it's just how you do things, and they don't see how it's wrong. But they can tell by the reaction of the other person that it's wrong. And if somebody were to do it to them, they have an internal negative reaction, don't they? Just because you don't know thou shalt not steal, if somebody steals from you, it makes you mad. You know it's sin. That's, see, that kind of thinking is why this is so per, per, pervasive in the church. Okay? It's still sin. It's still a gross violation of God's created order, and it requires repentance. Okay? It doesn't matter how ignorant you are. It doesn't mean you're not doing the damage. And it doesn't mean you're not responsible. I didn't mean to back my car over your three-year-old, but guess what? Your three-year-old still laying on my car, huh? Right? Everybody wants to talk about intent. You know what? Intent only matters to God. To the rest of it, of us, effect is what matters. There's somebody else over here. Yeah, Matt? Um, is domestic oppression essentially the misuse of and wrongly applied biblical headship? Because you made a comment about that earlier. Authority. Because biblical headship is so distorted, I don't even like to use the language. And we're going to talk about authority in a minute. I have a whole chapter on authority and leadership. And we talk about hyperheadship and covering theology and all that bogus stuff. Okay. And as part of that is, if that were the case, then men, couldn't, uh, men can't truly be domestically oppressed. But you're not saying that. Both men and no. Men can be Absolutely. I can't even tell you how many situations me and the rest of our counseling team have dealt with over the last several years where the wife is the oppressor, the mom is the oppressor. It's, it's incredible. We have to understand that God has said, this is my or- created order. If you violate his created order, that is sin by definition, whether it's intentional or not. You know what the difference is? How mu- what the repentance looks like. That's the only thing that's different. It's still sin. That's what we have to come back to. We have to come back to that pure line. Okay. It was, what people do in ignorance is one thing. That requires a different kind of repentance. What they do with malice of forethought, that's a whole different thing. Jan, you had a hand up. Well, I was thinking of a question about, well, what if that's how they grew up and not what they know. But what, one of the things you said earlier as you began to define it is that the domestic oppressor doesn't behave this way outside of the home. So right. they, there's two different ways they behave. Yeah, yeah. And so they know it's wrong. And you know what? There's a, there's a simple thing called general revelation. Right? Every human being other than sociopaths have a conscience. That's that general revelation, that sense of right and wrong. Even if you don't have the law, read Romans 2. You know right from wrong. And if you're going against your own conscience, that in itself is sin. Again, read Romans 2. Uh, in your example of uh, backing over the three-year-old, uh, would you say that it's uh, accurate that a person who is an oppressor would try to twist that and make it somebody else? Yeah, they'll say yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah. And we're not there yet, but yeah, it's yeah, blame shifting is a big thing. We're not to that part of the conversation. The, the child's still under the car. There's damage done. So th- we have to look at the effect. So it doesn't matter whether there was intent there or not. The damage has been done. That's our starting place. That's our starting place. And if we don't have that, if we're not starting with that, that this is broken and it's my fault, either intentionally or not, 
If we don't start with that place, we may as well stop having the conversation. And I, I'm telling you, I run into that day after day after day. And that's why I've, I've counseled thousands. And I know that our counseling team has counseled hundreds. And the people that I, am, uh, that I do counseling ministry with around the, the country have counseled tens of thousands. And we do it every day. Yeah, the blame-shifting thing is part of the manipulation tactic. That's a whole other animal. That's a whole chapter. Yes, sir? If we have a choice of who to focus our attention on, the oppressor or the victims, how should we allocate our time? Well, we're the oppressed. The oppressed. We'll talk about the, the statistics and all that other kind of stuff. That's why the last chapter in the book, it talks about redeeming the oppressor. Can it be done? A very short chapter. Okay. Yeah, Rose. Uh, I think people are more familiar with the term narcissist. Is a narcissist the same as an emotional no. predator? No. An, an emotional predator is narcissistic, but they may not be a full blown narcissist. Okay. Full blown narcissism is another thing. Um, can you repeat the questions before you answer them? Sorry. That's a good idea. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Good idea. Thank you. <laughs> this is why I need a TA or somebody over here. Um, um, so, yeah, we have words matter. We have to use very distinct terms, Be- and they're distinctions with a difference. Okay, they're not distinctions with no difference. They are very specific. Think about this: of all the words that God could have used to communicate the truth about His nature and character, and His interaction with His creation, they're very specific words that He chose. Okay, not a single word. Not a single letter that's not intentionally and specifically chosen by God and put in there. We need to be just as intentional about our language when we're talking about this. As much as we possibly can. People think I'm a little bit radical about that. But I, I can't tell you how powerful words can be to bring comfort and hope and, and restoration to a person's life. Just as much as they can damage and wound and rip apart. Robert. Okay, it's going to have to be a short question because I've got to repeat it. So I think it's important that we mention that you look at several different translations to get a flavor of the word, not just one translation. Right, okay, yeah. As far as the words in the Bible and stuff like that, um, I have postgraduate degrees in hermeneutics, biblical languages, and all that. So I bring that to this conversation. Um, I'm not just opening up, you know, a translation of the Bible and guessing. Um, but there are a lot of people who understand God's Word really, really well, who you can find that kind of information. But my whole point was, the language is specific. The language is specific. So that's one of the things I'm doing with this, with this book and with this workshop, is trying to help us understand, all, of all the words that we could choose, there are very specific words we need to take a hold of and use to communicate very clear ideas. Hang on. Um, I realize oppressing is a learned trait, but is this genetic? It's only genetic in the fact that every human being, because of the fallen rebellious nature of us as sinners, we have built into us the basic desire to be the one most worthy of worship. That is the original sin. Disobedience wasn't the original sin. The original sin was the desire to be worthy of worship, and that drove the disobedience. That is the, that's the original sin nature that's in every single one of us. If you take a look at every conflict that you're a part of, you'll find that you and the other person are usually vying to be the one who's right, the one who's dominant, the one who's the winner, right? I tell you, it's, it's just inherent in us. And then, if we, don't, if we don't have Christ indwelling us, if we don't have the Holy Spirit working, we'll, run, we'll just run like crazy people out in the woods with that. Anybody here not selfish? Anybody here not self-seeking, self-serving, self-focused? No hands. Okay. That means we all have inherent ability and the her- inherent tendency to misuse. Anybody here have to teach their children to share their toys with their sibling? Anybody have to teach their child not to lay on the floor and throw a tantrum? 
Anybody here have to tell a, tell a child only one time to do something? No, no hands. Why? Because it's inherent in us to be the boss of our own life. And if somebody gets in our way, to run over them. That's our tendency as sinners. Yeah, and people want to talk about it learned. Yeah, it's learned by all kinds of ways. But don't forget what's driving it. Because we can learn all kinds of things. We can choose what we're going to incorporate into our life or not. Okay? Yeah, when you're three, it's one thing. But when you're 33, big difference. Okay? So I hope that answers the question. Um, One more and then we'll take a break. Sharon. Working with someone with same-sex attraction. Um, I find myself starting here. With the Imago Day. Yes. You find yourself starting with the Imago Day, right. The oppression that right. they go through. And so do you feel like that is where usually, like that's a... Okay, that's a really good question. So the, the bottom line, no matter what the counseling situation is, you always want to come down to, do they understand their inherent worth as someone who's creating the image of God? That's where we always start doesn't matter what the issue is. Okay? We always start there. The next thing we focus on is identity in Christ. Have they surrendered their heart and life to Jesus Christ? The two-word summary of the New Testament is in Christ, in Christo. That in Christ and its cognates occur 164 times in the New Testament. It is the most in Scripture, is in Christ. Two of the four most important words in Scripture are in Christ. So if you can help, this, what this does, is they have no sense of their identity in Christ. Their identity is in what that person has poured into their life and told them they are. Beaten into them. Coerced, manipulated into them. And then, what is their understanding of the nature and character of God and what is their confidence in the nature and character of God and how that intersects with their life? Those are the basics. It doesn't matter what your counseling situation is. Those are the basics that are always going to be at issue in some manner or form. So it doesn't matter if you're dealing with somebody who's, who is, um, uh, can't get along with anybody, goes from one bad relationship to another, is in you know, uh, full-blown uh, transgenderism or anything in between, heroin, gambling, pornography, whatever it happens to be, it always comes down to those basics. Always comes down to those basics. And if you use that as your core paradigm, you're going to be okay. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back in, uh, let's come back at 10 after, right?